This Thank conference will now be recorded. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are in control and you are able and willing to answer our prayers when we seek your face. Lord, we are petitioning you for all these prayer requests that we just discussed. We know that you are able and willing to heal us and bless us and provide for us, protect us. And uh, we thank you that you cause your countenance to shine upon us and give us the gift of shalom, peace, wholeness, and fulfillment like no other source on earth can. We're so very thankful for your Holy Spirit, whose job it is to indwell us and lead, guide, and direct us in the way that we should go in alignment and harmony with scripture and your will. Father, we thank you for your wonderful son, Jesus Christ, who paid the ultimate price for all the sin of the earth world, though we did not deserve it. Father, we're so very thankful. And we just don't have the words to uh, honor and praise you enough. Lord, we, we lift up this Bible study to may it all be in your honor and glory. And may, may your Holy Spirit bring to mind uh, other things that we can relate from different parts of the Bible so that we thoroughly understand exactly what it is that you're saying. We lift up all those that couldn't be here tonight, Father, and uh, all our extended families and the pandemic or the pandemic. You know, you know. Uh, the situation we're trusting you that uh, you can cause all things to come together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose according to romans 8 28 we're so thankful for it in the power of yeshua hamashiach we thank you in advance in the messiah's name jesus christ amen man all right um i'll also uh regards to all of you from uh uh dan and sheila roy they moved into their new house in hiawassee and they're under a, a pile of boxes trying to get everything organized they said they'll be back with us this coming week um so if you're following along we're in uh first corinthians in chapter 10 and this study will begin in verse number 15. um and what we'll discover here is that Paul is finishing the topic which he began all the way back in chapter 8 uh, where there were a couple of groups of people in this Corinthian church where one group had this belief system that they could do whatever it is that they wanted to do that was that their right to do and and uh, there was another group that held on to a little bit different belief system in both groups didn't really care for one another. And they needed to be dealt with in a timely fashion. Uh, and you remember that in the Corinthian church that this there was this issue about eating meat uh, that was purchased from the pagan temples. Uh, and they would have these festivals where they would burn an abundance of, uh, of sacrificed animal fat uh and and um uh, when they would burn all of this fat off they were left with an abundance of meat uh and so they didn't have a lot of uh refer they didn't have refrigeration back in those days and so they had to sell it off at discounted prices and so those people who were in the in the corinthian church that had a lot of intelligence they believed they uh they were smarter than everybody else around them. And their position was of that this meat, that they had a right to eat this meat uh, and to buy it at a high discount. Um, and, and that the fact that they were, they were sacrificed to idol worship at these temples, those idols were merely pieces of stone or pieces of wood or pieces of metal. And that's all it was. And so they were really sacrificed to nothing. And um, 
And so therefore, <laughs> this group of people thought they have the right to eat it, not going to lose their salvation over it, and so they were going to do it. And then they had other people who perhaps were recently delivered from these pagan churches and came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Um, and they took the position, how in the world could you, a brother in Christ, go down to the pagan temple and buy this meat and eat it uh, because it was sacrificed to, uh, to uh, pagan idols? And so Paul starts out chapter 10 that we studied last week by saying, there were those who were saying, if it's wrong to eat this meat sacrificed by, at the pagan temples, then why is it that I am so blessed? Why is it that I, am, I have such a privileged life? Uh, don't you think that if, if, if I was doing something wrong, that God would not bless me and God would not give me a privileged life? And uh, and what we learned last week is that just because you are blessed and just because you have a privileged life, it doesn't mean that you do not have the ability to crash and burn uh, if you're not doing the right things. And you remember in our last study, Paul gave an example to this pagan church, this uh, Corinthian church, sorry, that uh about the nation of israel that that they were blessed and that they were privileged and that they were released from bondage out of egypt and they they they, they left very wealthy uh and they were um they were on their way to the promised land and as they were in the wilderness they forgot god and that resulted in them crashing and burning. You remember I told you there were there were some 600,000 men that were so, of soldier age. And then there were women and children and elders. Uh, so there might have been as many as a couple million people in that group of Jews. And they had prosperity and they had privilege. And yet only two. <laughs> Only two out of the 400 made it into the promised land. They crashed and they burned. And so prosperity and privilege is not always a guarantee of a positive outcome. And, and Paul used that example of the nation of Israel after they were freed from bondage in Egypt. Now, Paul finishes this discussion of how, how to get these two groups within the church to get along and to stop hating one another. And he offers a plan to work things out. So that's where we're at. We're gonna start with Diane verses of uh, uh, 15 through 18, Diane, nice and loud. One five through one eight. I speak to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Jesus Christ? Is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because, is that it? Keep going. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Um, consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat sacrificial sacrifices participate in the altar? All right, thank you for that. So in order to fully understand the meaning of these verses that Diane just read, we need to know a little bit about the culture, the first century culture and the belief system of, of, the, of, of the Jews. Now, you know, you look at, you look back at our modern world uh, and our eating habits have changed quite a bit since the first century. Uh, you know, any one of us can jump into our car and be all alone and we could drive up to one of a thousand different drive-through restaurants, order a meal and sit by ourselves 
themselves in the car and wolf down a cheeseburger, fries, and a soda. Uh, and that's pretty much what most people do these days uh, in modern times. But uh, oh, they, 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 <laughs> they eat by themselves, you see. And, but back in the first century, uh, they did not have drive through window restaurants back in those days for the horses and chariots, but rather their mealtime was very different than our modern mealtime. In the first century, a dining experience did not include silverware. They all ate with their hands, and typically they would, they would have uh, several loaves of bread. It was typically flat bread like pita bread. And you would just take, uh, you would just dig into the pile of bread and tear off a piece and throw the rest back. And then you had various bowls of gravy and sauces. In the Bible, remember dipping in the sop is what it was referred to. And everybody would take a piece of bread and they would rip off some and they would dunk it in the sauce. And then and then they have a piece of bread left that they just bit off from and they go back to a different bowl or the same bowl and they dip a second time. So it's called, we call it double dipping, yeah. you see, and, and, and it's, it's not really sanitary according to our culture, but that's what they did back in the first century. And, and so, uh, and so what was happening and what developed the Jews in their belief system because of this is, uh, it's called assimilation. Uh, everybody would be assimilating the same food, but bear in mind that because of the, the styling of the way that they ate back in the first century with the double dipping and so forth, and I don't wanna get too graphic with this, but essentially it's likely that some of the DNA of one person got into the bowl and another person was eating it and swallowing it and so not only was there an assimilation of food but there was a, an assimilation of dna of one another during meal time so assimilation of body chemistry you see and so um and so the 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 Orthodox Jews, the Rabbinic Jews, have this mystical viewpoint about eating. And you remember that one of the criticisms that the Pharisees had of Jesus is that they said that Jesus eats with sinners. Remember that we studied that in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus eats with sinners, and so they had this deeper spiritual and mystical belief system uh, through rabbinic Judaism that if you eat with sinners, then you're going to assimilate the body chemistry of those sinners, which was due to the styling of the way that they ate meals with one another. And so they said, Jesus, they said, they said, this, this guy, Jesus is allowing sinners to assimilate with him. Uh, and so that was the mystical uh, or spiritual viewpoint that the, that the rabbinic Judaism, Ju Jews had regarding eating. So that might give you a little bit of a better understanding. Now, one of the sacrifices that they did was a peace offering. And so they had this huge brazen altar and they would bring in a large calf or cow or some other large animal and it would be sacrificed. And then they would butcher it and they'd barbecue it. Now the party who gave this, this peace offering sacrifice got to take a chunk of that barbecue home with them. <laughs> back home to eat with his family and his friends. And then the rest of the animal uh, would, uh, uh, the leftovers and all that stuff would be consumed in the fire at the brazen altar and then the smoke would ascend, um, you know, and, and, and so notice the, Rabbis too. Rabbis too. notice the words he used there are the same words 
that we use for communion. Um, and, in the, and in the Greek, in the Greek, it has the idea of oneness or the idea of oneness. So he's saying there's more to eating than just going down to a pagan temple and eating well. It has to do with oneness. It had to do with assimilation. All right. Uh, uh, Carrie Crawford, would you unmute and read verses 19 to 22, nice and loud? Okay. What say again, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Hi, right, thank you. So, so Paul is offering us uh, and these people a warning. He's offering us a warning. When you go down to these pagan temples and you think you're getting this lovely roast beef at a great discount and you don't have any problem eating down there, what he's saying is behind this activity, that piece of wood that they call an idol or that piece of stone, which they call an idol or that piece of metal, which they call an idol that is what they call a demonic reality and as a believer as a as a christian we have no business to be associating ourselves with the demonic realities that are in the world now our modern culture uh our human nature has us believe that we are way too sophisticated to believe that there are demonic realities. After all, you know, that was probably just for ancient men. That's what our human nature might, might, might lead us to think because, you know, back in the first century, they weren't all that sophisticated. Uh, these highly educated members of the Corinthian church, they, they were too sophisticated to believe in demonic realities, their belief system said demonic realities are just bogus. So we need to go back to the word of God uh, to see what it is that Jesus said about demonic realities. And in fact, Jesus said that demonic realities do exist. And what might that tell you? <clears throat> about you or me or some of these people in the first century uh, Corinthian church, does that make you or me or those members of Corinthian church more sophisticated? You know, are we more informed than Jesus? You know, as, as an intelligent human being, uh, uh, we, have, we have scientific minds, we have lots of education, but what about the mind of Jesus Christ? What about the mind of Jesus who created all things? Jesus spoke of the reality of a demonic reality. And if you were to, if you were to study some of the psyche, uh, psychiatry of modern medicine, and you'll find many writings confirming such demonic realities. A uh, one example came many years ago. This Dr. Richard Gallagher, who was a professor of psychiatry at New York Medical College, and he talked about one of his patients, a young woman who he called Julia, and he said periodically in our presence, Julia would go into a, a trance state of a reoccurring nature. Her trances were accompanied by an unusual phenomenon. Out of her mouth would come various threats and taunts such as, leave her alone, you idiot, she's ours, and, and leave, leave, you imbecile. And the tone of her voice 
was marketably markedly different than in Julia's regular voice, and sometimes sounding guttural, sometimes sounding vaguely masculine. At, at some points, even her voice became high pitched. And most of her comments during her trances uh, displayed a disdain for anything that was religious or sacred. And Julia was uh, also was was uh, in, in possession of knowledge of events that were far beyond any possibility of her natural acquisition. She commonly reported information about the relatives of people in that facility, like family deaths and family illnesses, without her ever having observed them or been informed of them. As an example, she knew the personality and the precise manner of death, uh, uh, the exact type of cancer of a relative of the team of a team member of this college that no one could conceivably have guessed. And because of the complexity of the case, this professor, this doctor and professor, said we assembled a team of mental health professionals. And Julia exhibited enormous strength despite many holding her down with all of their might. They struggled. They restrained her for about 30 minutes. And during that time, she actually levitated about a half of a foot into the air. And understand that this professor is not a Bible thumper. This professor is not a TV evangelist. This professor is a scientist. He's got a scientific mind and he's witnessing something that he does not understand or comprehend. And the Bible tells us that there are forces that we cannot see. Some are good and some are evil. And I believe that if we were to pay attention to the activities currently going on in our world today, you can actually see demonic activity marching through our world right now. We can witness the demonic activities right now. Just take a look at the news in a single day. Also, uh, there are some religious currently, re, sorry, religions, religions currently who are demonstrating demonic activity. What does the Bible say about, about Satan? It says that he was perfect in beauty. He was perfect in knowledge. He was perfect in wisdom until the day of that, that iniquity was found in him. And what was found in him? You remember what his iniquity was. It was pride. You remember Satan said, I will be like the most high God. I will ascend to the sites of the north. I am going to be like the Most High. And yet some of the other religions are demonstrating the very same kinds of pride and the very same kinds of deception and the very same kinds of deception spoken about Satan. And, and what did John tell us in the book of Revelation? He said, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And, 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 and for the word of God, which had not worshiped the beast, neither the image, neither had received his mark upon his forehead or their hands. And they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, who are, those, who are those people in modern days that are behaving with the same characteristics of Satan? It's not the Baptists. It's not the Catholics. But yet you have had, you can see, we've seen on the news of the last 20 or 30 years, wards, and they cut people's heads off who profess their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that's intentional desecration of those houses of worship and they're doing exactly the kind of uh, of uh, demonic uh, activity that satan 
uh, profess to do in the Bible. So Paul is telling these Corinthians, God has not called you to get all chummy with these demons. God hasn't called you to go down and worship idols at the idol temples. And God has not called you to hang out with demonic reality, but rather God has called you to glorify him. So Paul, uh, we're going to stop for a few minutes and talk about the first uh, from verses 15 to 22. And then we're going to finish up the second half of our study with five marks that Paul is going to give us on what our lives should look like when we are committed to living a life to glorify God. So we'll, we'll pick up on that in a few minutes. Verses 15 to 22, who has a comment, a question, or uh, a takeaway from those verses? All right, Sylvia's first. Okay, Jesus did say that demonic realities do exist. In fact, he cast them out. Um, when I was listening to what Rob was saying, uh, what jumped into my mind was, remember when recently when Jonathan Kahn uh, uh, wrote his most recent books, uh, he talked about in New York City where uh, the, the, the tallest building in New York City, and it even showed a picture, was lit up to resemble the face of Shiva or whatever you know, idol goddess. It was. Sheol, maybe. Right, no, no, Sheol is, Sorry. is hell. It's oh, Shiva, uh, it, I believe, is the one. And it was lit up on, like, like a face of a demon on the top of the tallest building in New York. This is just recently. There's a lot of demonic activity that's going on. And and it's, it's working against the church, especially in America. Yeah, yeah, well, because we will learn later on that, that we have to be intentional about being set apart, being sanctified. That's right. Who else has a comment or a question or a takeaway about verses 15 to 22? All right. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody? And there's one other thing communion is an, a oneness and assimilation with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to be careful. I mean, they drew a parallel uh, with eating, you know, eating with, with people who are um, maybe idol worshipers is probably not where you need to be. You know, it's, it's sharing fellowship, it's putting yourself in harm's way. Yeah, you can witness to people like that, but when it comes to fellowshipping, hanging out, becoming their friend, and you know that they worship Satan, you know that they have uh, uh, that, they, that they are not they are against Christians. Why would we want to hang out with them? Take a witness to them, but we wouldn't want to become like them. Okay, you have to be really careful. Guard your heart. All right, Hi, uh, Pamela, and then Carrie. Go ahead. Uh, the difficult part is when they're your family. You know, it's just That's makes it kind of difficult. That's hard. That's where we need to stand together in prayer. Now, a lot of us have a lot of us have family that are not saved, and we just need to stand together in prayer against things. Like, oh, I forgot to pray for. Oh well, no, we prayed for the for the for the family that had the daughter that tried to commit suicide again. Yeah. Suicide is a is a, is a spiritual possession. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's that's what I mean. Um, more than just uh, not not believers, but believing in all these demonic things that are taking place in the in the world today, it's frightening. And and the young people, especially children, are being yeah. just possessed in that way. It's frightening. Yeah, they're going down that path, and it's a very scary one. They're, they're teaching children to hate themselves first, okay? That's how they get them, they get them down that path. Hate themselves. And um, what was that? I don't know. I was going to say. 
All right, thank you, Pam. Uh, Carrie Crawford, you're next. Speak on the verse about um, communion. So verse 16, I think that is saying it's not, okay, we have the cup and we have the bread, but it's not about the cup or the bread. It's about, is it not the communion? So we are, because anybody can get a cup of wine or grape juice or whatever, or we can get a loaf of bread, but it's about what it's about. We are having communion together, um, remembering the blood, the body and the blood of Christ. And so therefore we are of one spirit. So we have to be careful about form. So yes, so back then, as you said, they're following assimilation, but don't follow form. You know what your purpose is for which what you're doing. And also, I just want to say, um, it's so easy to get caught up. When we read about idolatry back here. It's not, oh, well, wow, I would never do that. But it's nowadays it's so easy to get caught up in what we may not even be labeled as idolatry and um i was looking at a movie the other and on tv this is right there for children and it's so innocent it can pull them in it's just like a a, a, a movie or even a cartoon mm -hmm. i uh, i was looking at a movie i started looking at it well anyway by the time i got through I, you had to go through pretty much the whole movie. And I said, what are they doing? But anyway, it was really about, what do you call it? Being able to come out of your body, go, and go somewhere else, you're so, you'll go somewhere else, come back and you do these things. So that was demonic. So I said, oh, wow, didn't even know that existed. Yeah. But I'm so easy to get pulled into something you, you because of what Paul calls ignorance. Yep. Yeah. You know, to build on that, the devil came to kill, steal, and destroy, and they're even using children's cartoons. Okay, if you sit through some of these children's cartoons, you should see some of the messages, okay? You know, homosexuality is one, and uh, all the other agendas that, that uh, you know, you know are against biblical principles. And it seems all nice and cute and all that, but you listen to that stuff. It's you know, and and it reminds me of when culture back in the 80s, whatever, Murphy Brown uh, used humor to come against the cultural norm, which is uh, two parents, a, a man and a woman, and and she had the first, you know. Uh, well, I don't know, on, on TV, uh, pregnancy without a husband, without any, you know, any explanation where, you know, oh, yeah. who he was or anything, and used humor to pass that over to make culture, that, or the people, the people accept this new cultural norm. And, you know, it's all postmodern crap. I mean, the whole thing has just snowballed since then. Yeah, and, and, uh, the media, Hollywood, yes. movies, the, the TV, they all have agenda. an agenda. And the agenda is being led by the devil. And if you plan to, to live your life, glorify God, you need to be sanctified. You need to be set apart. Right. And so therefore, if you see these kinds of things, you have to, you have to not allow yourself to be led and guide, guided by, it's so easy to sit and watch the TV and just start accepting things. Yeah. Uh, so you have to you have to manage yourself. All right, um, uh, Diane Sabom is next, and then Arnie is after. Well, I was just going to say a lot of what uh, or Carrie said it much better than I would have, but I just was thinking of Jesus as the bread of life, and you know that we're we're all part. Uh, we're all to eat of the bread of life and that being jesus mm -hmm. thank you yeah and he came that we might have life and life more abundantly so that fits right in i mean and the devil came to steal steal kill destroy and jesus came to do the opposite yeah and don't ever forget that when the devil attacks which the devil will do uh when devil attacked jesus what did he do he quoted 
scripture. scripture. And so if you were ever attacked by by the devil, you need to talk scripture. You need to speak scripture. Arnie, you're next. Thank you, Diane. Good job. I know you're going to find this really fascinating, Rob. But I've read this lesson, tonight's lesson, three times today. And I really don't have any comments tonight, so I had to look for one. And so the only one I could come up with is in verse 22. It says, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy, or are we stronger than he is? It's like a mouse trying to provoke a cat. It doesn't turn out very well. <laughs> there you go. Good That's job. Right. Good job. All right. Thank you. Any other comments or questions or, or, or takeaways? All right. We're now at verse 23. And from 23 to the end of the chapter, Paul is giving us five marks of those who want to live their life to glorify God. Uh, this is something where you can take these five marks that we're going to discuss now and see how your life aligns with those five marks that are written in here in the Word of God and how we are to live our life to glorify God. So uh, um, let's start with uh, Joyce DeWald. Would you unmute and read first, just verse 23 to get us started? You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. All right, so the first mark of a person who lives their life glorifying God is that they know the difference between things that they are able to do and things that they really should do. You know, most questions that we ask ourselves if we're following our human nature, you know, can I drink, can I smoke, can I do this or that and still be safe, uh, saved? Uh, the behavioral limits, you know, how far to the edge can I get before I start to jeopardize my salvation? That's kind of what our human nature would push us to think. You know, that where if we take one more step, we're going to be stepping over on the hell side of the line. And, and, and so that, that we, we want to question as human beings, we want to question where that line is because we don't, we want to enjoy ourselves. We don't want to cross over the line. Paul is telling us that a person who lives their life glorifying God is not saying, what is it that I can do? but rather, what should I do? We, we are offered all kinds of opportunities in our lives every single day. Um, and uh, uh, we should not be looking at choices and decisions based upon what it is that we want for our own life, but rather uh, we should be asking ourselves, if I do this activity, Will I be glorifying God? If I do this activity, will I be promoting spiritual growth? If I, if I do this activity, am I, am I propelling myself or somebody around me further into the will of God for my life or for their life, or will it become a, a hindrance? If you are truly interested in glorifying God, you're not asking questions about what it is that you can get away with. You're not asking questions of how far can I push the limit until I lose my salvation, but rather you ask yourself, should I be doing this activity in order that God's will might be fulfilled in my life? That's the first mark of a person who lives their life glorifying God. Joyce, read verse 24 now, please. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. All right, so the second mark of a person who lives their life glorifying God is that we are to live not for self, but rather we are to live for the good of other people. 
when you call yourself a Christian, what does that mean? A Christian, the definition of a Christian would be to be an imitator of Jesus Christ. And what did what did Jesus Christ do? Can hang you on. still hear us? Hang on, I'm having a technical error yeah, here. We had a little issue, but we're working on it. Can so you all hear? Yes. All right. All of a sudden, I couldn't see you. Uh, no. Just hang on. I'm I'm having a hang on. Sorry. Oh, there, there we go. go. Okay. Everybody Sorry disappeared that. all at once. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, so we're talking about about being imitators of Jesus Christ. And what is it that Jesus Christ did while he was here? He served other people. And when he was hanging on the cross, he he said, I, I will drink of the cup of the wrath of God so that you don't have to. Jesus lived for the sake of other people. And if we are going to be a person who glorifies God, that is how we are to order our lives. It's not about I want this or I want that. It's not about I'm going to buy this or I'm going to buy that, but rather, who can I encourage today? Who can I help today that needs help? Who, who can I be a blessing to today? You know, who is really struggling right now where I have the ability or I have the talent that I can lead them by the hand uh and and help them who, who who's struggling we are to be that kind of a person if we are going to be living our lives glorifying god you think about your own life in the past and you think about there's got to be a time for most of us where people came into our life just at the right moment where we needed help, we were late into the 11th hour of despair, we didn't know what we were going to do, we don't know, we didn't know how we were gonna get through this particular challenge, and somehow somebody just out of the blue showed up and blessed your life in a mighty way, and that entire episode, whatever happened, gives you, uh, for the rest of your life, a testimony uh, for you to be able to glorify God because God is the one that sent that person into your life. Amen. Uh, Pamela Sage, would you read verses 25, 26, and 27, please? Nice and loud. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. All right, so the third mark of a person who lives their life glorifying God does not go out looking for controversy. Ever met somebody that all they do is they turn up every rock and pebble to find controversy and anything going on? We are not attempting to figure out what's wrong in our society. And how many times do we see this when we go to church? There are people who are just wired in such a way uh, and that uh, you know you get email alerts, you get newsletters, you hear about all of these heresy hunting ministries, and uh, and everything is examined. And, and analyzed and getting people are getting worked up and they're getting upset and then and then you have newsletters from prophecy ministries and they're talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ and conspiracy theories and what happens you hang out with like-minded people and so a lot of your friends get the same newsletters and they get the same updates and and what happens is is it provokes all of these discussions about what's wrong in the church and what's wrong in our society 
And, and that is where people spend their time rather than spending their time glorifying God. We are not to spend time theorizing. We're not to spend our time judging. We're not to spend our time complaining, but rather we are to focus on what the Lord has placed before us every day, and then we are to glorify him. We spend lots of time talking and complaining about, uh, let's just say, a national coffee company who supports the gay movement or who supports abortion. And we spend lots of time talking about uh, and complaining about uh, you know, the styling of music that our praise and worship band is performing every Sunday. And that is not, that is not what the Bible teaches us the way we are to behave. But rather, we are to be a person who lives their life glorifying God. I do not have to go out looking for trouble in the world. You just stand around for a minute or two, it will find you. It'll show up. You know, and if that is what you're if that's what you're looking for, you'll find it. But if you want to be a person who lives their life glorifying God, you're not to look under every unturned stone for something that is wrong, but rather you are to find the good in your life and then glorify God. All right, Roger Hershey, do you feel like reading? Nice and loud, unmute yourself, verses 28, 29, and 30, please. I got 27. I'm there. But suppose someone warns you that that this meat has been offered to an idol. Don't eat it out of consideration for conscious of the one who told you. It might not be the matter of conscious for you, but it is for the other person. Am I reading the wrong place? 28, 29, and 30. Oh. Now, why should my freedom be limited by someone else? But, excuse me. Now, why should my freedom be limited by what someone else thinks? If I can, if I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? All right, so although this might appear to be contradicting to the third mark, this fourth mark of a person who lives their life glorifying God, we are to be sanctified from the culture. We are to be sanctified from the culture. And so um, let's just, I'm going to use an example that Sylvia and I discussed earlier today that she thought would be a good example for this. You remember when we started out last March doing Bible studies online because we could no longer meet due to the COVID uh, um, uh, quarantine, I um, subscribe to uh, Zoom. And we started doing Zoom meetings. And then you remember, um, I changed to gotomeeting.com, all right? And, and this is an example of what this fourth mark is. When, when I found out that the owner and president of Zoom uh, openly supports the abortion issue and and donates money to to um, uh, to the cause of promoting abortion. I I I talked to Sylvia about it and we prayed about it and we decided that we were not even for whatever it was fourteen or fifteen dollars a month. We were not going to support a company whose leader openly supports and promotes things that God hates, all right? Because 
because once I found that out, this is the point. Once I found that out and let people know my findings, if I continue to support Zoom, then the, the non-believing world can, can interpret that I am no different as a believer in Jesus Christ than those people down at his pagan church. I'm not sanctified. I'm not set apart. I'm not taking a stand for something. And so the mark of the person who glorifies God is not going to take a stand uh, for those things that pagans would do that is against the written word of God. We must be strong in our faith and we must be strong in our commitment uh, to do those things which God wants us to do and to hate those things which God wants us to hate. And, uh, and, and so once it became public knowledge that Zoom was a supporter of abortion and the Bible is against murder, which is what it is, I could no longer continue to subscribe to Zoom. And so I changed to go to meeting for that specific reason. And that's what they're talking about here. You have to be sanctified, you have to be set apart. And 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 you know, it's one thing like they're talking about to eat meat that's that's sacrificed. There's no prohibition to that, but once once you know you pray over a meal let's say uh to a pagan neighbor and then the pagan neighbor says oh by the way this was done at my pagan temple you know you have to take a stand you have to be set apart because you do not want to give the appearance that you're no different than his brothers and sisters at the pagan temple all right uh brother arn verses 31 32 and 33 nice and loud so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. So the fifth mark of a person who lives their life glorifying God is a person who understands that giving glory to God is number one priority of your life. We are here in this world to draw other people's attention to God. What, you know, what does it mean? What does the word glory mean? In the Old Testament, it has the meaning of greatness. It has the meaning of splendor. The New Testament adds some, some definitions of honor and praise in, in the word of God. And we are, to, we are here uh, to turn other people's hearts towards the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that Jesus said, let your light shine before men that when they see your good works, your good works will then glorify the Father in heaven. We don't want people to see our good works that glorify ourselves or promote ourselves. We don't want to see, have other people see our good works that glorify or promote our church, but rather we want to serve God in such a way that whatever it is we do and say and the way we behave is a witness of what God is doing, how God is transforming our lives. And, and then we give the glory to God. That is the purpose of our lives. And so how can we, uh, how can God receive glory from you and me? We are to fellowship with one another, we are to encourage one another. We are to yield to the Holy Spirit to do kingdom work in us and through us. And we are to give all the praise and all the glory to God. And so 
Live your life not for what you can do, but what you should do. Live your life not for yourself, but rather live your life for the good of others. Live your life creating con not creating controversy, but rather focus on what the Lord has placed before you and glorify him. Live your life not in darkness, but rather make a very clear distinction between light and darkness. You are to be sanctified. You are to be set apart. And then you give God the praise, the honor, and the thanks. And finally, live your life not like the pagans and the rest of the culture, but rather you set yourself apart. Amen? All right, so any comments, questions, or takeaways on any of the verses between 15 and 33 that we covered tonight? I like that one uh, That one point. Know the difference between the things that are permissible for you to do and the things that are beneficial. Not what I can do, what can I get away with, but what should I be doing and in, in alignment and harmony with the word and glorifying to God. Yeah, you do whatever you should do that's going to bring praise and honor and glory to God. Thank you, Mrs. Roger Hershey, you're up next. I think of peer pressure as a uh, thing here in the, in the sense that we have control of who, who uh, influences us, uh, the people that we come in contact with and who we refuse to come in contact with, not only people, but things like television, as to what we allow to feed our mind. And on the other hand, we also exhibit peer pressure to others. And we need to uh, be aware that our behavior influences other people. So I think of this lesson in a, in a different book term, but it's the same basic subject as peer pressure. Good yes, job. and it's our job to, to encourage people uh, and show them the way to glorify God, you know, and speak highly of, you know, lift Jesus higher and and the world will see that he is worthy and we be drawn unto him and they'll they'll see there's a difference between us and the rest of the world who all they can do is look down and be depressed and be angry and hateful and you know all these negative well if we show them all these positive things and how god has changed our lives then they're going to see a difference in us that's that's something they want yeah, I think what Roger brings up and that Sylvia is building on here, I think is very important for us to keep at the front of our minds. You know, culture, which are people and media, they, if you allow that, they, they can influence you and your behavior and pull you away from your relationship with God. And on the other hand, if you are centered and focused on growing in the word of God and living your life aligned with the word of God, you're, you're managing yourself with that can actually influence someone within the culture. So you're either being influenced by the culture or you're influencing someone within the culture and who's winning that battle? That's a really important question. If, if, if culture is influencing you, you're going in the wrong direction. If you are being influenced by the word of God and, and, and you're living your life that way, then you will not be able to, uh, to, to, uh, to dodge the fact that you're going to influence someone who God put within your path. You're going to be able to lead somebody and guide somebody to the word of God and pull them out of the culture, pull them out of that pagan world and give them an opportunity for eternal salvation. So we have a choice. We have a choice. We can either pay attention to culture and get influenced or pay attention to the word of God and be influenced by the word of God. And then we can be a good example to those who God sets within our path. Thank you, Roger. Good job. Who else has a comment or a question? Sylvia? Okay, I like this, uh, the second point. 
be more concerned for others rather than for self. Jesus himself gave us this example. He spent all of his time on earth being concerned for other people and, and not himself. And we are to serve others and encourage others and to make them feel loved. I gave, gave a little sign to our uh, grand girl that makes someone feel loved today, you know, um, and, and that's not what the culture is teaching those kids, okay? Uh, what I wanted to do is use uh, an example, real life example of when, uh, when we were in a in a in dire straits a couple about two and a half years ago, Diane and Mike Sabom were so kind to us, and they um, put us up at their home so we would be close to the hospital for Rob to get treatment on chemotherapy. And I tell you what, it was the best encouragement that we could have received. It was a wonderful thing. We could have stayed at a hotel nearby, but the Holy Spirit impressed on me. We need to take her up on her invitation. And we are so glad that we did to this day. We are so glad that we did because now we have them as lovely friends and we can pray for each other and we can encourage each other and teach each other the word and give each other words of encouragement and consolation and, and help. And it's just a wonderful thing. And, and that wouldn't have been possible if they were so concerned with their lives instead of being concerned and helping us. Yeah, and uh, what, a, what a great example. Thank you again, Diane, and yes. thank you to Mike. To Mike. Uh, yes. You know, and, and at the time, we had only just met. Just barely uh, met them. Where they came to one of our Bible study classes, mm -hmm. and I guess the Holy Spirit uh, talked to it them, and they came up and offered me. We barely knew them, uh, but at the time they were staying in Hiawassee, and and Diane, God bless her, she got in her car and she drove back to Atlanta and she cooked meals for us, for us so that wonderful. we didn't have to prepare meals. She made meals for us for the, for the whole time we stayed at their house, and uh, and and that's a great example of 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 living and caring for other people rather than for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, the definition of, of Christianity is the exact opposite of the definition of human nature. Human nature is all about self-centered mm -hmm. behavior. And when you accept the Lord, you open up your this tabernacle, this temporary dwelling we have, uh, and, and you invite the Holy Spirit to indwell within you, and then you have a choice. Do you yield to your Holy to the Holy Spirit to live for other people according to the definition of, of Christianity, which is loving God with all your heart? That's a very unselfish uh, act, and to love your neighbor as yourself, that's a very unselfish act, or do you yield to your human nature, which is loving yourself unconditionally and doing only for yourself you see and this is a great example i'm sure we can all give examples yeah, there's many more examples uh, in this group i just used that one but there but we there we have many examples but that this is just one example of unconditional love for your brothers and for your sisters yes. rather than caring for yourself she, Mike and Diane did not have to step forward. We, right. we barely knew them. They yeah. could have just let it slide. Yeah. But they're godly people, and they're and they're they're following the word of God. And 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 here it is, years later, and we're still talking about how what a difference what a they blessing. made. What, what a, a blessing. blessing they are in our lives. Yeah. And each and every one of you, in different ways over the years, Has have blessed have well. blessed us to be beyond measure because of your unconditional love and your faithfulness to attending these Bible studies other, and your prayers and so forth. Yes. And so that is what they're talking about here. You are to do that with all people. You live your life in such a way to, to help other people so that God is glorified yes. rather than yourself being glorified. All right, Pamela Sage, you've got, go, you've got the floor. Uh, get getting more and more difficult to do that nowadays because i guess i'm at a bad place today they 
they want us to separate ourselves uh, from each other. Quarantine, six feet apart, don't touch anybody. You know, it's all about that nowadays. And, and I believe that that's part of the devil working. Just got notification on my mom's place where she's staying. All the 25 rules that we have being able to go visit our own parent in a place where we're spending an awfully lot of money to have her there. And, and I'm having trouble with that. I'm really struggling with that because it's making it, and because I live out of state, you know, I gotta wait two weeks when I get there to be able to see her. I gotta go to the COVID test. I gotta, I, I can't, I can't touch her. I can't hug her. I can't give her a little kiss on the cheek. I can't, I, I am so, so angry at all of these rules. And I guess maybe it's me. I don't like being told what, when, where, how I can do anything. So it's all of these things are just making it difficult for us to be able to show that love. For instance, you know, somebody wants to come and stay at my house because they have a need like you. Oh, oh, but you might bring COVID. Oh, you know, I'm just so tired of it that I can hardly breathe today. So I'm in a bad spot for what we're talking about. We'll pray for you. Maybe that's the reason we're talking in this lesson. Who knows? But we're going to pray on that. But the thing is, is that, oh, I'll go. I'm sorry, Carrie, go ahead. It's your turn. Uh, I think that kind of brings my thought to what number three said. Don't get yourself, don't go looking for controversy. and maybe that's what diane is kind of i mean pamela is kind of saying that nowadays no you 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 want to have peace you try to seek peace but sometimes like like rob is saying if you be still enough it'll come the controversy will come find you um and i think what we are experiencing nowadays is you do want to have peace you want to have peace in your home you want to have peace with your like, like she's talking about with her mom, but uh, what comes upon you but the rules of life? Okay, you gotta follow, you want to see your mom, you got to follow these rules. Okay, well, she didn't ask for all that, but controversy, she doesn't agree with it, but she has to deal with it. And she has, she wants to deal with it in love and caring. And also part of it bring, makes her just mm, angry inside. So we, we have all these, they're not new emotions, but different emotions because of the things we are experiencing in 2021. Although we say there's nothing new under the sun. So these people back then, they sit, were able to sit down and assimilate, eat with their hands. And there are people nowadays who do that, like the Ethiopians and but 2021, we have the things that come and meet you in your face while you seek peace. So you must, uh, and that makes it even more important to be able to follow these things, stay focused, lest you put yourself in a, you know, you fall out of union with God. It's, you, uh, it makes it to me more imperative to know these five things and live them every day as best you can, because it's like I said, it's so easy to be pulled away. Yeah, thank you for that, Carrie. And you know, you know, I'll just also just build on what Carrie's saying. The Bible tells us that we are to live our lives glorifying God. Yeah, we have challenges today, but you know, I, I must confess, my mom's been gone for seven years. And it's still very sad for me. And oh, how I wish I could go through those 25 rules just to see her again. So maybe it maybe it's time that those of us that still have our parents around that are having to deal with these extra rules, maybe we should glorify God that our parents are still alive. Uh, yeah. Diane Sabon, yeah. you're next. Well, what do you think it means that Jesus came to bring a sword? Well, it's a division, okay, between truth and error. Uh, and, and also, 
uh, you know, the adversary is at war with God. Okay. So, so <laughs> you know, when you can't, you can't just, you know, uh, I, okay. So he came as a servant the first time he's coming back as a king on a horse in full battle array. Okay. He's going to come and do his judgment on the evil of this planet. And, and that sword, it's a divider because if people either they believe in God and the truth and the or huh? yeah, and, the written. and the written word of God, that's the truth, or they don't. And, and so that's the divider, okay? Dividing joy from marrow, okay? It's, it's, it, it's, uh, you know, you can't, there's no middle ground, in other words. You can't just be, well, you know, I like God, but I don't like the God of the Bible. And I kind of like the devil, but I don't really, you know, I want to do his stuff, you know, but I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm just lukewarm. Well, you know what Revelation says God does with lukewarm people? He spews them out and they're on the other side, okay? <laughs> yeah, so the sword is definitely... Uh, a, a demarcation of a division. division it's a division between the truth, truth and error and error and uh and when he comes back with his sword uh he is going to destroy all evil and all those who follow evil that's right i think thank god for that well, that's uh, what's diane do you have any follow-up on that dear well I mean, I'm thinking of several things. One, one is I'm not sure I'm understanding quite what you're saying about the culture. Are you saying you're not saying we sh surely not saying we're sub to submit to an evil culture? Or, I just I know we see our culture fading away. The ability of Christians to to actually evangelize, I think, will soon become a crime. <laughs> and and um, yeah. And and do we not fight with truth? Do we not use spiritual warfare? Um, certainly in our prayers, but but also to to try to to sway the culture. And I think of thinking of Jesus, thinking of his role in totally changing Western civilization, mm -hmm. and and. And do we, we don't just let it go. I mean, personally, by being by being a witness to the people who come within within our realm, do we? I mean, don't we have no, to do? No, no. I think I agree with you. I don't think I said that. I think I think I I would absolutely agree with you that that you know when we were talking earlier about either being influenced by the culture or we influencing the culture. You're right. When God places somebody in your path. And you're living your life in alignment with the Word of God. You definitely uh, can can uh, uh, influence someone who is a non-believer and plant seeds for salvation. And that is our responsibility. Yes, yeah, what we are in the world. We are not of the world. Okay. So when when number four came out, I know that may have been the genesis of your, of your confusion when it says that we should be set apart, sanctified from the culture so that we do not resemble unbelievers. Well, and I also said it earlier, we shouldn't be hanging out with them and being buddy, buddy friends all the time because we'll become like them, birds of a feather, you know? But the thing is, is that we are in the world, not of the world. We are to be a witness we are to be a light. We should reflect the light of the Omiti Ha'olam, the light of the world, Jesus. And and but we are not of the world. In other words, we are citizens of heaven. When just we to take, the, just to take one example, Al Mohler. I mean, he he speaks about what is wrong a lot. And would you would you think that he's looking for controversy? I mean, he's he's talking well, about about yeah. how how our freedoms are being are falling away, and we're we're losing we're losing to the LBGTQ, you know, whatever the AB, a, gay ABCs and the you know everything. Yes. We can't. Dr. Seuss is out. The cancel culture. I mean, it's one thing after another, and and we, if we we have to say what's wrong, don't we? Yeah, I agree with yes. you. And when I said you have to be sanctified and set apart, 
uh, it's in the context of taking a stand for that which is right and righteous. Yeah. And so it's no different. I'm trying to think of another example. It's no different than you know than two friends that are teenagers. You know, and 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 one lights up a joint. And then the other one says, no, I'm not going to do that because that's not the right way to live my life. And, and then you can walk away. Well, if, if you don't take a stand, if you don't sanctify, if you don't set apart, then then the party who's smoking the pot uh, believes that you as a Christian, uh, when you start smoking with them, that you're no different than uh, those who don't go to church. Right. So this being sanctified and set apart is 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 taking a stand for that which is right and righteous and in alignment with the Word of God, no matter what. And so and so that is part of how we influence those people who God puts in our path is by saying what's right, doing what's right. And standing for what's right and righteous in the eyes of the Lord. Yeah, but we don't want to be argumentative. Okay, we want to reason with them. Okay, we don't go after controversy in a sense of just stirring the pot. You see what I'm saying? We we don't judge, we don't complain. We state the facts. Why is this wrong? Why is this why is abortion wrong? Because that child has a right to life from the moment of conception. You know, that, that, that baby is a real person from the moment of conception, and they should not be murdered, okay, arbitrarily yeah, for fact, someone's choice. In fact, Take out so the word maybe. I... Pardon? Take out the word maybe is a person. It is a person from conception. Did I say maybe? Biologically and no, every she other. Said ba she said baby, baby. not I baby. Said baby. Not baby. Said baby. baby. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, Sylvia and I have taught many times the festival of Hanukkah, the festival of lights. And when we discuss that festival of lights, we talk about we talk about the history in the Bible of uh, what time of the year it was that Jesus was born. And then we talk about going back nine months to see what what time of the year that was and we discover that that in that study that the conception of jesus was likely during the month of kislev which is december which is when hanukkah is the festival of lights and we we've come to the conclusion with the many different scriptures that we've quoted in that particular study which we've taught many times is that life life begins, begins not just at birth it's not just at conception but it's all the way back to the very beginning of uh, genesis before genesis 1 1 when god when god spoke everything into existence he already had you in his mind as to when you were going to appear and and that you are a real living human being from the moment that god thought you Finish into existence and so and so we're but, but back to your point amiti ha alam entered the world the light of the world entered the world in mid-december and and that's when when he was conceived and then nine months later okay then you've got then you've got him entering the world with feast of tabernacles yeah anyway no my point was what i was making is that life was talking about we were talking about abortion life begins long before the birth all right any other comments or questions because we are going go ahead carrie carrie crawford I just wanted to go back to the sword. Um, it says his word is sharper than a two-edged sword. So we're talking about, uh, you know, how do we handle controversy? Don't get too much into it. Uh, <clears throat> but it said when he returns, he's coming back with a sword. He's not going to worry about controversy. His word is sharper on both edges. So he will not be. Um, he would be straight down the middle. What did I say? And what did you do? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Terry. Any other comments? Well, we didn't cover number five again. We need to understand that giving God the glory is a really our main purpose in life and to show others his light. And uh, when we lift Jesus higher, he will draw men unto himself, others unto himself. So as we as we glorify God, it's going to draw other people into salvation. You see, and that is really a purpose because we are to love God, number one. And number two, to love to love one another. So there you go. That's that's our purpose in life. And in glorifying God, we're going to attract other people to Him. And so they're going to receive eternal life as well. So it's the most loving thing you could do. Good job, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Comments. Okay. It's a good lesson. Uh, All right. You might want to keep these five, these five signs of a life that glorifies God handy, and uh, just check in with them on a regular basis. Um, next Thursday night, we're going to begin uh, chapter eleven of First Corinthians. We'll do verses one through sixteen. <clears throat> this coming Monday, we will finish Acts chapter thirteen. That'll be verses thirteen through fifty-two in Acts chapter thirteen. And um, I just want to uh, once again thank each and every one of you for your faithful attendance. Yes, glad and, you could uh, be here. Glad you're here, and thank you because that is a great encouragement. Please don't forget that each and every one of our Bible studies are recorded now, and we've got over 700 recorded Bible studies on YouTube, and you're welcome to share any of those with anybody who might benefit from it and we appreciate you doing that uh so thank you for that and our um, new number is 52,007 what uh we're at 52,800 and, and change uh Maybe as of today YouTube. yeah so, so this goes much beyond this little group here yeah so. so so your comments are being listened to by the yeah. world out there and we're yeah. hoping that some of your comments might plant a seed uh, roger did you have a comment or are you just no okay all right um i am going to ask um uh joyce would you uh would you do a closing prayer uh to start with and then carrie crawford would you finish us with the closing prayer for the evening let's go to the lord and pray dear heavenly father we want to thank you for everything you have done for us there's not a one of us that you have not heard complain at some time help us to remember and think of what we have and not complain about what we don't have most of all Thank you, dear Lord, for staying with us. You've heard our prayers for those that need your help physically. Please be with them and do help them. And dear Lord, we just thank you so much for sacrificing your son for us and for the love that Jesus has given to us. Mm. And dear God, we thank you for our, our being able to even come together tonight on one accord and learn more about your word and learn more about how you want us to live in these times. We thank you for our, for Mr. And Mrs. Chastner, who has done such a great job in bringing forth the truth, especially the five things we really need to think about every day that we make sure you are glorified. Let us each um, keep these with us and, and put them around our arms, put them in our hearts so we can improve our daily lives, especially how we interact with others, how we show forth ourselves on a daily or even an hourly basis that we are not finding argument and controversy, however, always being willing to speak your truth and show your truth and let our lives be a living example of you let us not put our candle on a, a candle under a bushel but let our light shine so that you will be glorified and and we thank you for the prayers that went up tonight we know that you have already heard us those who are seeking healing that there be healing and you said by by your stripes we're healed so we are believing that all are healed who seek it 
and let us have healing in the world, in our governments, in the with all people. Let people be pulled into salvation. And you said, if we lift you up, you will draw all men unto you. So let us be found lifting you up so that people are wanting to know who you are. Let there be a revival in this nation, a turnaround to truth. These things I ask in your name and bless all the families represented here and all the families of the earth. And we thank you for everything and all blessings. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you all very much. We